Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 79. I believe the common denominator of the universe is not harmony, but chaos, hostility, and murder. Werner Herzog. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Masterclass, and specifically Werner Herzog's Masterclass. I am super, super, super excited about this course uh, that's going to be coming out real soon. But if you enroll now early, you'll get early access to his course. If you guys don't know who Werner Herzog is, he's an Academy Award-winning director. If you've heard his voice You'll know who he is. He directed Grizzly Man, among other great documentaries and feature films. He's got a total of 70 feature films, plus over 50 awards. It's remarkable. So he decided to team up with Masterclass.com to create an amazing online resource for filmmakers as he teaches you, as he says, the essentials of filmmaking that you can learn within two weeks and you definitely don't have to go to film school. This is over five hours of video. You'll get a workbook that you could download as well as access to Werner as well. So the course is coming out very, very soon, but if you sign up now, you'll get early access. So all you have to do is head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash masterclass to download this amazing course, which I've already signed up for because I want to I want to take it. Now, a lot of you have been emailing me, asking me about uh, This Is Meg and what, the updates on what we're doing with This Is Meg. Well, This Is Meg is going to be launching their crowdfunding campaign June 21st. So please mark the calendar, guys. We need all the help we can get. And we're going to have some amazing incentives for uh, film lovers, for comedy lovers, as well as for us indie film hustlers out there. What we decided to do is put together that amazing membership course, which I am now calling the Indie Film Syndicate. That's right. And the reason why I called it the syndicate is the definition of a syndicate is a self-organizing group of individuals, companies, or corporations formed to transact some specific business to pursue and promote shared interests. So I thought it was a perfect name for the membership site that we put together. Now, I wanted to let you guys know what you're going to get in the Indie Film Syndicate. You'll get access to a ton, a ton of already created online content, like uh, our Filmmaking Hacks course, our Twitter Hacks course, how I got 10,000 Twitter followers in 10 weeks, and now that's ballooned up to almost 30,000 followers. Uh, Our Film Festival Hacks course, which is worth the price of admission alone on how to submit to film festivals. You're going to get sneak previews of uh, the Million Dollar Business of Screenwriting by Paul Castro. You're going to be seeing a sneak preview of the Screenwriting Blueprint by Michael Haig and Chris Volger, Uh, our DSLR video tips course, as well as how to build a website through WordPress, and a social media marketing tips course on all things Facebook, Pinterest, and so on, which we'll be adding to constantly. This entire membership is going to be being added to monthly. So as new courses come out, you get access to them. So if we have a $200 course or something like that that comes out, you'll get it because you're part of our membership, as well as exclusive things that we're going to be doing like um, twice a month, uh, Google Hangouts, where you can talk to us about what's going on with This Is Meg. And also, by the way, you'll see the entire process of how we made This Is Meg. So you can kind of see, you're a fly on the wall and see what we're going through. So right now, we just finished making our poster, which I'm going to put in the show notes so you can see what the poster looks like. We're going to come out with a video on how we put together the poster, discussing the the marketing of it and what we're doing and our thoughts behind it. Uh, That's all within the membership, as well as how we're crowdfunding this thing. Because today, actually, as I'm recording this, we're shooting our pitch video. So we are going to go through how we how we wrote the pitch video, how we're shooting it, how we're promoting and so on. So you're going to go through this entire process through how we're crowdfunding it, how we're shooting it and so forth. And then eventually how how we're uh, editing it, market, uh, shooting it, editing it, marketing it and selling it. And hopefully we can rinse and repeat and continue to do this for many years to come, which is the goal of every filmmaker's career, I hope. So if you want to get in early, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash full access. 
And by doing that, you'll get a special introductory early pricing. And it will be released to you guys earlier than anybody else. So we're going to be releasing it hopefully in the next week or two. I've been working really, really hard on putting this whole thing together for you. So I cannot wait for you guys to check it out. Oh, and if you want to check out our crowdfunding campaign, you could head over to thisismeg.com when it's up on the 21st. And then afterward, you'll go to the after the crowdfunding campaign is over, then you'll see it'll go directly to our website. So you can see how we're marketing and putting that website together as well. So this episode is a fun, fun episode, man. I wanted to bring Christian on for a while and uh, I finally got him locked down to do the interview with us. And Christian goes back with me, God, probably about 10 years. He was a big fan of our, of, of uh, my film Broken and a lot of the stuff he was doing at the time. So we kind of were kindred spirits in that way. And Christian's gone on to be uh, a very successful director in his own right. He has uh, directed, he started off with like, I think it was a $10,000 budget horror movie. And now he's in the millions of dollar action movies that he's doing internationally, shooting all over the world. It's kind of crazy. And the story of how he did it coming out of Palm Springs, California, which if many of you don't know, Palm Springs is probably about a couple hours outside of, if not farther, out of L.A. So it's pretty much not L.A. by any stretch of the imagination. So he kind of did it on his own in a, a small town, not a, not a, not a, um, a film town. And uh, he's worked with some amazing talent, and he's done some crazy, crazy action and horror movies, and uh, it's pretty inspiring to hear his story. So I wanted to bring him on the show so you guys can get an idea of uh, how he did it. So without further ado, here's my interview with Christian Sesma. I'd like to welcome to the show Christian Sesma. How you doing, brother? What's up, Ferrari? How you doing, man? Good. So, so Christian and I go back... Way, ooh, way back. Yeah, like eight, at least eight years. Bro, I like was, dude, I'm a mega fan from the from the Red Princess Blues days. Yeah, back from in the beginning, from like the beginning, beginning. Thing. Yeah, back in the day. So it's at least at least five, six years ago. Yeah, and, I want to say like 2007. Yeah, around there. Yeah, so that's yeah, it's a while. That's definitely yeah, a while. I know, I know why. I know how I came across your stuff. Like I was looking to do like vf like how to do vfx stuff oh, and i came across broken. Like, dude this guy's dope you did the broken you saw yes, broken stuff yes, yeah, broken. yeah yeah i was like yo this dude's on point <laughs> i appreciate it yeah man. no and, and that's what happened i mean i was like i do i was doing a tiny tiny little uh, uh horror thing mm-hmm. and uh all we needed was just like a few muzzle flashes like freaking vfx oh well. no you type in the word muzzle flash in google and we pop up somewhere i'm sure oh, totally even dude. today i think we still do yeah totally so that that's how it happened i was like man this guy's from the same like he's doing it from the same kind of camp that like you know film school that i'm from which is just go and do it right the, Rodri- right. the rodriguez camp so yeah so so christian and i known each other for a few years and i've i've been watching uh christian's uh career flourish on a facebook <laughs> <laughs> so i'm always it's in, all fake it's, it's all i always see it and i kind of see his movies as he goes through and i'm always you know we tweet and you know yeah. like each other hey what's great man congrats all that kind of stuff so i wanted to bring him on the show because uh christian kind of came you know he's one of those filmmakers that did not get anything handed to him he kind of like Oh. You kind of did it from he bootstrapped himself up, and I know a little bit Smack about the st- yeah, I knew a little bit about the story, so I wanted to kind of get into it a little bit. But first and yeah. foremost, so what made you want to become a filmmaker? Because originally you were a restaurateur, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, man. Like, I mean, literally, my story goes like this. I think I've said it so many times; it's so crazy. It's mm-hmm. like, I mean, I was always, always, always a film buff, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, since freaking day zero. I mean, I and I grew up. I'm an '80s kid, so I sure. grew up on everything that was everything like freaking indie star wars freaking yeah, yeah of course everything, the, the, right? the, be- the best decade the best decade of all time i think so, <laughs> so i mean that's kind of like i mean i was just always in the movie theater tv all that stuff and then anyways like i went off to college and you know whatever and i was supposed to i, I got my degree in anthropology mm-hmm. from san diego state and you know I, I went in there to teach and you know anthropology is a lot of writing so i got into writing and creative writing and all that kind of crap but uh, I was always – I put myself through college in the restaurant business because you know, my family had a restaurant or has a restaurant in Palm Springs and all that stuff. And so after college, like uh, I came back home, which is Palm Springs, and 
we were supposed to franchise this place out and all this stuff, like, you know, like a Chipotle type style, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, that summer, like I had only been home like two months, dude. And my appendix ruptures. Oh, that's yeah. Bad. True story. Appendix ruptures. And I end up in the hospital bed for a month. Oh, it was really bad. I was like, it's one of those, like, no joke. It was really, really close. I mean, it was like a, a actual near death experience. <laughs> Got it. Like no kidding. But on the hospital bed, I read Robert Rodriguez's 10 minute film school. Oh yeah, the um the uh, uh Rebel Without a Crew. Well, it was Rebel Without a Crew, but then there was also like the DVDs, I think it was yeah. Online, I think it was online. They had like transcripts of like the little things that he would do, like the behind the scenes stuff, mm -hmm. of, like on like you know the Spy Kids stuff and all those. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, there was tons of stuff like that. Yeah, on, all yeah. those type of things. So I just, like I I somehow I came across all that. And I was already a fan of 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 the whole you know Tarantino Rodriguez camp of the ba band apart posse, mm -hmm. and uh, dude, I don't know. It was just one of those things where I was like super inspired, and I was like, uh, man, I set myself a goal. I was like, a year from now, when I get out of this hospital bed, uh, I'm gonna make a short film, and mm -hmm. you know, because I was right, I knew how to write, you mm -hmm. know, because you know, uh, I I did creative writing and things like that. So, man, no kidding. Like a year to the day, I picked up like a shitty little Sony handy cam, like the tiny, like five hundred dollar kind at like mm -hmm, Best Buy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, nothing. It was like nothing. I, you know, well, the technology was a little different back then too. Hugely different. <laughs> hugely different. I, I picked up a tiny camera. It was like a tiny, like a literally like in desktop editing software, and and I and I picked up a copy of uh, Pulp Fiction, American Beauty. And some other screenplays just so I could teach myself the structure of screenplay writing. Mm -hmm. And I made this short film, man. And it like it got into the film festival here at Palm Springs. They have a kind of big film mm -hmm. festival here. They do. Springs. They do. So they had a big short film festival here too. And I got into that for – I don't know what, how that happened. Some friggin' miracle. By some miracle I got mm -hmm. in. And, and it just kind of snowballed after that, man. I just was like, man, this is what I was – meant to do and want to do and discovered my passion for this. And I was like, well, I think I have a knack for that, you know? And ever since it's really just been a friggin' trial by fire learning as I go process. So yeah, Ro that's how I can describe it. So Robert is a, a big influence on you. I would say the single most influence of <laughs> it was that. And then when I saw kill bill, I was already a huge Pulp Fiction fan of Reservoir yeah, of course. Yeah, Tarantino fan, of course. Bill for me at the time because, like, again, that just came out. And was, I had just was picking up a camera, dude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, teaching myself how to do this. And, and that one was a huge inspiration, too, where it was like, wait, you can do whatever the F you want to do? Like, it was like Kill Bill was one of those movies where like, hey, you can do whatever you want to do. You know what the, you know what the movie was for me? Uh, and, it, and, and I look back and now, it's, it's a fun movie. But the concept was like of of that you can do whatever you want to do was uh, once upon a time in Mexico. Yeah, that was the one I saw him like doing stuff, and I had been a big fan. Of, I mean, Mariachi came out when I was in, yeah. in high school, right. so I was working at the video store. So I was I followed Robert's career since like I mean I saw Mariachi in the theater. Like I wow. mean I mean back I go back with Robert. So I studied all his stuff, but that was the movie that was kind of just finally. I said, "Hey, you could do this," and that's when I picked up the uh, the mini DV and shot broken. So yeah. we we kind of come from the same influences. Totally mini DV, the little camera. Dude. Yeah, I had the DVX one hundred A, which was badass back yep. in the day, man. That was yep. that was the camera. Yep. So you shot a movie called On Bloody Sunday. That yeah, that was I. I did a movie a, a feature before that was the my first full length feature, which mm -hmm. was I did I did two short films, and then I did. And I was like, man, I better step up because I, every everybody, I was like, man, you better make a show, you better make a feature, you better make a feature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, you know, I using all the, you know, knowing everybody here in Palm Springs and all that stuff, I made a movie called Six Thirty. It was like we made it for like ten thousand bucks. It was like borrowing money from like my dad and my aunt, the usual story. Sure, Classic, sure, sure. Credit cards, right, 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 right. Yeah, the whole shebang. Did that, and that got bought by a little company called Westlake. But dude, it got put out everywhere, like Blockbuster, Fries. Mm -hmm. It was a different time. It was a different time. Yeah, there, it was before the DVD bubble burst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and so right after that, I did a little movie called Bloody Sunday, and then Warner's Home put that out. But now with on Bloody Sunday, you have the the one big thing that a lot of indie filmmakers don't understand is that you had a star in it. 
and and from the Robert camp, a a, a big Robert star, which right. was Danny Trejo. Yeah. So how did you get Danny Trejo on such a small budget? And what was the budget on On Bloody Sunday? On Bloody Sunday was a hundred thousand bucks. Okay, so you you boosted that up. So how and how did you get that hundred thousand bucks? If you want me asking, like no, it was like I had kind of made a little splash here in the in again in your own hometown, type sure. Of thing, you know, and there was just you know local money guys that you know, wanted to maybe invest in making a movie, this and that. And, mm-hmm. you know, one guy was like, well, you know, you know, a, a kind of fi- you know, financier guy was like, well, you know, I want to maybe look into different stuff. And I was like, Hey man, for, you know, we just did this little six thirty movie for nothing, you know, with like 75 G's to hundred G's, we can make something cool at the time. Like horror was selling like crazy. And we mm-hmm. had teamed up with another distributor that somehow I got in, in, you know, whatever with, and it was, and they had an output deal with Warner Home. Mm-hmm. And it, it just was like a really, you know, again, and this was like the third time I ever picked up a camera type shit. You know, it was right, like, right. it's like, I always said that for me, man, my film school is like on shelves. So yeah. it's, it's like, it's been, and like you said, man, you said it, it's like, it's been like that process. It's never, it's been very unapologetic. It's been like making mistakes publicly. Mm-hmm. It's been, which I think is like, it's again, it's unapologetic, but it's also like it, it prepares you for like what's to come. Because if you can't handle like the internet, <laughs> you can't handle it. Oh, internet. bro, oh, brother, listen, man. When when I came out with, with Broken, man, I I got I was it was awesome at the time because I got so much love. And then I, did, I got a Roger Ebert quote, and the haters came out. The hate oh. by by they were buying haterade by the by the pallet. Bro, and that's and that's before the term haterade even happened. Oh no, that was and that was before trolling. Right. Like right. troll trolls now, weren't now even a crazy. thing. Now, now it's, it's ridiculous. Like, now people do it for fun. Yeah, but back I mean, so it was brutal. Brutal. Nope. And filmmakers in general and film buffs are even more brutal than oh, general. Yeah, we're we're douchebags, man. We're, we're bad. <laughs> Look at the poor Ghostbusters trailer. <laughs> Dude, you know it's funny, like the first one I was like, okay. The new one, I'm like, that's better. Like, I don't know. You just it, what it is. You're you're stand. You're like you're fucking with sacred ground now. So you're never gonna. No, you're yeah, never. <laughs> I, you know, look, I just saw it again, and I just saw. I just watched a, a show, a screen junkie show, uh, that talked like they did a ten minute talk about this, and I had it listening in the background. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like it's this like, is like this is ridiculous. But with that said, I did see both trailers, and I'm and now we're gonna go off topic, uh, yeah. guys, for a second. I did see the trailer. We're just gonna geek out for a second. I did see the trailers, and in my opinion is, look, they look like it looks like a, it'll be like a fun. Well, it's not a Ghostbusters movie. No, in my eyes, it's it's just another comedy, another yes. Paul Fig comedy. But the way they brought this back, it shows like there's no respect for the original. And with something so hollow, this is hollowed ground. Yes. So because it did not like, there's so many ways you could have brought, like, like how, like, Cre- for instance, like Jurassic Creed World did it right. Jurassic World did it right. Like they that kept guy going knew back exactly what Jurassic Park was, right? But, and they kept referring back to it. Yes. Not yes. one thing. Like I just saw the new trailer this, today, and they're like, "Oh, and you know, it's it is. Are there ghosts? Is it real?" I'm like, seriously? Right. Like you're, you're right. in New York? We went through this 20 years ago. Yeah, totally right. You know, like you're at right. least. Th- that's the kind of way you kind of reboot something like this, yes. and as you have to pay respect to the original, original material, 100%. and that's what Marvel's doing so well. That's what yep. Star Wars did insanely yep. well. Yep. I mean, whether you like the movie or not, at least they paid respect to move I saw it on seven to seven the- times in the theater. I saw your Facebook, dude. I know seven uh- times. <laughs> <laughs> it's also because, like, my little one, she's like, she was total Star Wars geek too. She's like, "What are we doing today? Want to go watch Star Wars? Yeah, yes. okay, let's go." <laughs> Okay. So it's on it's on a constant loop now at the house, I'm assuming. It's pretty it's it's on a lot. <laughs> but anyway, so let's digress out of uh we digressed <laughs> through we digress. through our, our our Ghostbusters uh, geek talk. Um but can you can you discuss a little bit of how important a bankable star is when you're looking for distribution? I mean, because I'm imagining Danny Trejo helped a lot on Bloody Sunday. Yeah, I mean at the time at the time that's what happened. I mean, there was no they needed one somebody recognizable at the time, and that and I said, and I think at the time, and that was two thousand seven when I did that. Mm-hmm. It was still a diff. It was even still a different landscape than it is today, oh, which God. is even tougher. You know, mm-hmm. like now, Danny's not. Yeah, Danny on a on a hundred thousand dollar movie might not do the same because because Danny does a lot of movies now. 
he does a lot of movies. And you, you know, you now again, you know, what's funny is Danny in the new movie you have coming out mm-hmm. uh, next month. Like I called him up. I'm like, dude, do you want to just do something for fun? He, like I said, we've done a lot now together, which mm-hmm. is cool. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, you still, again, nowadays, unless you have a ginormous star, you need a whole bunch of name uh, actors. You need a, an ensemble. And he's like part of an ensemble. He's a good ensemble actor. Yes, absolutely. But he's so, not going to carry a movie all yeah, by himself. And, you know, anymore. nowadays, man, without a bankable name, you can't even, for at least the genre that I'm doing, which is oh. action, action comedy, stuff like that, action mm-hmm. stuff, you can't even get a movie made without it. You just can't. Nobody's going to finance it, you know? Right. And it's just because there's too, it's just too much competition. Yeah. It's just it's just the game. You know, it sucks because I would love to just go in and pick the best actor for the job, which is just not the case anymore. Now it's like, who's the most bankable actor for the job? Who's going to sell Who's going to sell Europe? Who's going to sell it. Japan? That's literally who's... what it is. I mean, literally, I just did – I'm supposed to do something in June, and I written this thing, and they approved the treatment. I wrote it. Paid for it, and all of a sudden they get to like, wait, this is way too ethnic. I was like, what? <laughs> you can't make this the bad guy a Japanese guy. I'm like, yeah, but the hero is a Japanese guy. They're like, no, no, it's not going to sell in Japan. No, you got to, you got to like make the thugs like very just generic. You can't give them a specific ethnicity. I was like, this is dumb. Yeah, but, but but I mean, and, and and the kind of I mean, you're making genre movies, so you love genre. I'm a big fan of genre. I mean, a lot of basically my entire career so far, up to this date, has been very genre based yeah, as well. So. Um, but at a certain point, you're an artist. You, yes, you want to express yourself as an artist, and dealing with all this kind of stuff sometimes, I, I imagine, has to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> it, yeah, it's the most. It's one of the most frustrating parts of it, you know. But it's like. You know, me and my, you know, my guys and because I have worked with a pretty tight knit team and mm-hmm. we're just always like, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to play the game or are we going to like not play the game? You know, and so I've always been a one. It's just like if I'm going to change the game, I got to I got to try to do it from the inside out. You know, I've never been one to really think that the game changes from the outside in. You know, I think you kind of have to infiltrate mm-hmm. and then change it from the inside kind of like. You know, as a natural process, I think you know, and kind of like what well, like what Robert did with uh, Desperado. Totally, I mean, he came yeah. in like. Do you know that before Desperado, there had not been a female co-star Latina in wow. like forty years wow. in a in, in a Hollywood movie before wow. Salma? That's crazy, isn't it? That's crazy. Now you think about it, like, oh, there's Latinas everywhere. I mean, look at All Fast and Furious. I mean, come right. on, yeah. Yeah. it's 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 a whole different world now, but. That's just the way it was. And he did it that way. He like completely got in the back door and yep. and did his thing. And same thing with Quentin. Quentin did, you know, whatever he wanted to do. Right. Uh, you make money, they let you do a lot of stuff. No, exactly. <laughs> you gotta you, you know, you, you show them you can do it and they you know, and again then you, then all of a sudden you're you're a genius and you did something new. Right, exactly. But really you're just like, I don't know, I just did what I wanted to do. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that's what some of the things I preach all the time is like just just Nobody wants another Robert Rodriguez. Nobody wants right. another Quentin Tarantino because they're already there. They yeah. want another Christian. They want another Alex. They want another John Doe. For sure. You know what I mean? As opposed to trying to, you know, rip off somebody else's thing. You could be inspired because we're all inspired by everything. For I mean, sure. Of course. I mean, all those guys are inspired by it. You know? I mean, Jesus, I mean, Quentin, hello. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's the most verbal of them all. Exactly. Know? So after after on, Sun, uh, on Bloody Sunday, you did a movie called Shoot the Hero, which is kind of yeah, where I met like you. my first kind of real movie. Yeah. Right, with Jason and Danny. How yeah. how was the production of that and then and, and how to sell it? And, and when you sold it, how did that go? Yeah, that was like the first time like I ever had any kind of real cash and that the budget on that was like I mean real cash like for an indie, you know, like mm-hmm. you had hundreds of thousands, right? So we had like 400 Gs for that. Mm-hmm. And at the time that was, you know, it's a lot for me. Mm-hmm. And you know, that was just one of those things where it just got put together cuz a casting director I knew that I was dealing with kind of brought up Jason and I was obviously a ginormous J fan. Sure, of course. And I was like, "Wait, it would be awesome if we made J this kind of weird geeky dork guy, not, you know, not like, you know, Nooch Nooch, mm-hmm. who I'm all I'm a huge Nooch fan, mm-hmm. you know, but you know, just make him kind of play anti what he's usually done." And then pit him against, you know, the bad guy it was Danny Trey. It was, a, again, it was a very kind of weird action comedy. And I was really inspired by movies like The Big Hit mm-hmm. and things like that, where it's really like tongue in cheek and fun type of thing. And, you know, like, you know, Kiss, Kiss Bang Bang and more more like Gross Point Blank, mm-hmm. which really like Shoot the Hero was my like 
gross point blank and the big hit baby, you know, kind mm-hmm, of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just that kind of fun, fun thing. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then selling it and then selling it. Do you, how, how involved are you in the selling process of this? Or are you just basically a gun for hire? No, no, no. These are like, these are things I put together and I'm a producer on. You okay. Know? So, okay. So like, yeah. So with these, for, and for most of the projects, I'm always right, right, direct and produce. And on the producing side, I mean, you know, the physical line producers, they'll do their stuff. But, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to kind of getting talent involved mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. sales and all that stuff and raising financing, I'm pretty heavily involved in that. <clears throat> now and especially then but shoot the hero was definitely one of those things and you know uh we sold it to shoreline at the time and you know they put it out i mean it was it was cool man it, you know it was like the first kind of nice little vod release and it was on showtime for like two years now real quick how did you get it to your district like i'm trying to break it down so people can right. understand so the process basically we shopped it around with a uh you know with a sales rep okay and, with, with producer's uh, rep got it yeah, right. pro- yeah. Rep. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they, they landed, they landed the distributors for it and they kind of, you know, they take it from there and, you know, without getting into the crazy dynamics of what that is, mm-hmm. and how those splits go and all that stuff and the percentages and things like that. I mean, you, you just hope that you, you know, you can come out, break even. And, you know, if you're breaking even on a movie, you won. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, on an indie movie. I mean, we're not talking like, you know, tent poles, but mm-hmm. on an indie movie, if you break even or make a little bit of money, you did well. You're you know? very, like you're 98% <clears throat> ahead of everybody else. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Shoot the Hero was kind of, was kind of that. And, you know, um, fuck man, it, it just, uh, they did, they did okay with it. I think, you know, cable, cable was pretty cool with it. And then, again, it, and it happened in 2009. Different, t- so, different landscape again. Different landscape again. Netflix was barely coming out. Like Netflix was still transitioning from like the actual Netflix like delivery DVD to the house, mm-hmm. you know, to now like streaming. You know, streaming hadn't hadn't hit yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and and VOD was you know like the only VOD was just like Time Warner Cable and those oh, yeah. direct TV things. Like just those, you know, that was pretty kind of newish. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, but again, this landscape just keeps changing. Now, what you've worked with a bunch of different personalities and actors yeah. in all of your movies. Some of them, I'm imagining, you know, the big macho, you know, dudes and stuff like that. How do you handle, you know, dealing with egos, personalities, uh, you know, on set? Like any tips that you can give? You, um, you know, filmmakers who are going to deal with, you know, seasoned actors or okay, specifically I, egos and stuff like that. I'm not saying that any of your guys are egomaniacs. I'm you just know saying. What? I believe me, I've worked with, I mean, like, you know, just not like on this last thing. For instance, we had Michael Jai White, mm-hmm. Mike Madsen, and Danny Trejo all in the scene. Mm-hmm. And if you went by just kind of the rumors of like, oh my God, and you know, it's going to be like a bunch of egomaniacs on set. Mm-hmm. That's not, I think it, it really, I mean, if my advice to like any filmmakers is like, look, the tone of the movie comes from you. You're the captain, you know, mm-hmm. you're the general, you're the one who they're going to look up to and say, and, and these guys, these, these seasoned veterans who have been on hundred million dollar sets are going to step on your indie and go, all right, am I here wasting my time? Or does this person actually have a vision? Do they know what they want? You know, am I wasting my time? Am I respected? You know, that kind of thing. So I've never had a problem with that ever, ever, ever. You know, I think just because, you know, I I respect, I was already, I was always a mega fan of these guys already, you Mm -hmm. know, but I don't fanboy out. I just was like, dude, this is awesome. They know, they know I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, we're going to do something for me, you know, we're going to do my thing here, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think setting the tone as the as the captain of the ship is crucial, right? Yeah. And, th- and then basically, if if you don't do something like that or show disrespect or don't uh, act like you don't know what you're doing, then that other side of these actors might oh, come they out. They will absolutely run right over you. They'll destroy you, right? They will destroy you, public, like right there in front of everyone. Mm-hmm. So again, I've not had that. I've not had that. <laughs> sure. You know, but you know, I've heard stories. You know, and. I guess it's just not my style, you know. It's like we always really have a, a really, really good time, right? So yeah, because I've had—I mean, I've—I've I've worked with a lot of you know actors as well, like, and and it's true. Like I've never had an issue either. Yeah, because uh, you're just a reg- you're a regular cat. Like yeah. we're just regular dudes that like movies, you know. And right. you know, you have these other guys that are doing it maybe for not the same reason, right? That you know 
guys that actually love movies do. And I think that these seasoned veterans ultimately come when it comes down to it, they are actual actors. You know, they do it for the love. They still maybe they might have forgotten sometimes. Like may have been maybe it's been a while since they've been on a set with people who actually love making movies, you know, mm-hmm, as opposed mm-hmm. to just the business of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when they do, it's really refreshing for them, I found. You know, now the, back to the purity of it. You know, now this last, the latest movie you're doing is Vigilante <coughs> Diaries, right? Yeah, Vigilante Diaries. Yep. Now uh, that's the biggest movie you've ever done. I don't know between that and Night Crew. Okay, those, budget those wise. Are, yeah, I'd say those are two. They're pretty big. I mean, I wouldn't say pretty big. I just for you. I mean, for an so, for, you're still indie. You're still indie. Oh, totally indie. I, th- yeah, totally, hundred percent. Now Vigilante Diaries started off as a a show, right? Dude, man, what a crazy journey. And it's funny, I just got an email today of the release and all that stuff. So that comes out June 24th mm-hmm. uh, in in limited theaters and VOD and then like Blu-ray. But yeah, I saw, but then I see on Facebook like the whole Russian premiere of that thing like yeah, so like a year ago, right? <laughs> here's what happened. Long, so I'm going to try to sum it up for the indie film hustle. Yes. <laughs> between jobs, just like I am right, like between gigs mm-hmm. – um, we were like, fuck, man, we got to work. You're like, we got to do something, right? Like, we got to, we better do something. So me and uh, a buddy of mine who is the co-writer and creator, Paul Sloan, who is the actual vigilante, mm-hmm. we go, man, let's, uh, let's, um, let's do like a web series. Again, a different landscape from when the time when a web series were really doing a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, um, so let's do a, a web series. And we'll, well, basically, the, the inspiration was to do a Punisher type web series because we're such Punisher oh, fans, you know. And you like? I'm assuming on the side note, you do you like oh, the new God, Punisher? That was it. That's that's the he's, right. He's the best Punisher ever. Go ahead. That's, ever that's, of all time. Let's move I mean, on. Shane, Shane the Punisher. <laughs> you know. So so we 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 make this crazy like web series, and it was and at the time it was financed by my buddies over at they had it was called Chill.com. Chill.com was like this they, – they were doing – like it was like a startup and um, they were doing kind of like the crowdfunding style, right? Mm-hmm. But they, they actually – it wasn't – they they put up the cash for it. So they, they gave us cash to make two episodes and we did a whole big old thing at like Comic-Con and it was Jason Mewes and it was my buddy Paul. Mm-hmm. And we did this – we did two 12-minute episodes of this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And Machinima – put it out as kind of like this little premiere and kind of got it out there saying, Hey, and the, the style was like, if people liked it, they'd, they buy into it like a crowdfunding style and we'd use that money to make more. Right. Mm-hmm. But you know, they gave us the initial startup cash, but that company, that kind of idea fizzled out and whatever happened. And we did with that, that footage was just floating out in the ether forever. Mm-hmm. And then a year later, <clears throat> um, we had just finished and premiered Night Crew, mm-hmm. uh, which is do I, I I'm dying for that thing to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, f- a producer buddy of mine and his financier guy was like, "Hey, dude, don't you still have 20 minutes of the original Vigilante Diaries web series floating around?" We're like, "Yeah, like, do you want to turn that into a feature? If you already have 20 minutes, then we'd only have to fund an hour." Right, <laughs> you're kidding and, me. Oh nope, my that's god, that's what happened. And we were like, uh, all right, we're bored again. In between projects, so in between the two projects, we made the web series. Then we went off to make I made a movie called Night Crew, and then a movie called A Wall. And then again, in between mo- movies, these guys were like, You want to go make this really quick? We're like, Yeah, fuck it. I don't, I don't know. We've always been on the thing like, don't say no to anything unless it's like junk, junk, you right, know, right, if right. it's us, yeah. Like if it's us, like there was like no money in it. So they're like, we'll give you a couple hundred grand. We're like, all right, let's go do it. And we did and we made the feature, which was the original Vigilante Diaries. And people loved it. And <laughs> it was funny. Like people dug it a lot. And they were like, we're we going to finance a, a sequel right off the bat. Because at one time, a distributor wanted both. Okay. And so we wrote a sequel. We did this and we went off to shoot this in Armenia. Okay. So we went off and shot Armenia. We shot London. We shot Scotland and oh. made this thing really big, like a Mission Impossible style flick, right? All right. We get back to the States and the rest of the funding drops out. And we're like, oh shit, what are we going to do with all this like amazing footage? 
Right. And it was just dead. It was dead. And we're like, holy crap. And then I was like, why don't we just make this into one giant indie film? You know, like I have Jeez. not, I had not seen anything like that before. Right. So another financier came in and gave us another, you know, chunk of cash to finish this off and shoot a new beginning, shoot a new ending, incorporate all this footage that we had shot overseas and stuff. And, um, so man, we did that and it now has become the definitive vigilante diaries, which is this crazy kill bill meets mission impossible mashup genre flick that's it's crazy it's the crazy like i've I, for me it's nuts dude it's nuts so two so two questions one yeah. how was it shooting in armenia <laughs> amazing <laughs> tell me like tell me how how it goes what the process is because I've, yeah, I've never so, shot there right so the the uh yeah nobody had we mm-hmm. were like the first like big quote unquote big like real american production to ever step foot there and shoot anything mm-hmm. and it was because um, the main bad guy in the movie, Armand Shanian, like he's a really, really famous Armenian actor, mm-hmm. that he, um, American Armenian actor. Mm-hmm. And um, his parents are very famous um, uh, actors there. And, you know, our, our financier was Armenian. Mm-hmm. And they were like, it would be just like, yo, let's go back to freaking Palm Springs and shoot. They were like, let's go back to the old country. Mm-hmm. We can take over the capital city and like have the run to the city. Mm-hmm. And dude, that's what it was. I mean, wow. we did, we took over the city for two weeks and like car chases, tunnels, gunfights. I mean, expl- we just, it was big, man, really, really big. And we, and, and on a dime, you know, really on a, on a real dime. And, um, you know, we did it and, you know, we came back with this really cool international feeling indie film, which, you know, you as we, we all you know, know that you don't happen. get that. It yeah. doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It does not happen, you know? And so, you know, and so now Anchor Bay is putting it out and HBO is putting that out in the fall and things like that. So, you know, I'm really excited for people to see. It's really, it's pretty nutty. It's a nutty, nutty film. And how was the Russian premiere? That thing looked Right. So Sick. That, yeah, it was it was in Armenia. So again, because we come from that indie school of like no money, right. what we did is we wrote this opera scene where the main bad it's very it was very like Ronin ish, uh-huh, you know. Uh-huh. Remember the ice skating scene in Ronin with yeah, the that's right, awesome. So we we basically did that kind of idea where um the main bad guy arrives because he's kind of like the main bad guy is this huge mobster in armenia and he's loved by the by the public kind of like a robin hood style and he arrives and so what we did is we we actually premiered the original movie and used it as a backdrop for this for the movie so that actual stuff that the the arrival and all that stuff we shot it for the movie of the arrival of the bad guy (laughs) coming in right so we used it we doubled it we had massive crowds and it was, and we used the, uh, and we kind of just shot different locations. That's crazy, man. Yeah. That's it crazy. Was pretty nice. so That's we, very indie hustle. Totally. <laughs> totally. We're like, uh, we need a whole bunch of crowd and, and we got to make it look like he's entering this huge opera house. Cool. We'll double it for the, the premiere. You know? <laughs> Cause crazy. when else are you going to get everybody in suits and tuxes, you know? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, so and cool cars. So can you give any can you give us any tips on how you um negotiate with talent agents to secure your actors? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um without getting yourself in trouble. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, luckily, like I think it's really negotiating with talent is I've always found the best way is to be just brutally honest, you know, mm-hmm. because they've heard it all. You're not gonna bullshit agents. Mm-hmm. They've heard it all. They, you know, they feed off of everybody's fear. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes, they do. It's like if they it's their sharks, man. They're sharks. If they smell blood in the water, they're gonna go for it. So you better be as transparent as possible, like right off the bat. You know, I found that to be so I've just been like, hey, so and so, you know, I need a favor. You know, believe me, when when I call it Danny's agent, she goes, Oh, it's freaking Christian again. Yeah, all the time. All the time. <laughs> But, you know, we always work it out. But every single time she goes – because Danny's agent is Jason's agent too. Oh, is it? I didn't know yeah, that. Okay. Same, same person. Same – She and she's great. She's a mm-hmm. doll. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I've and heard she, she's wonderful. I've heard many people have worked with Danny. And she has. And, and the reality is she, she believed in me since On Bloody Sunday, to be honest with you. She gave me a shot there and, and let me use Danny, you know. And we've developed this relationship over the years, you know. And, 
you know, and then I have something in the fall that will will shoot with Danny again. You know, hopefully, knock on wood, that's going to go fine. How old is Danny? Danny has to be 150. Five. Is he really? I think he's like something like that. Oh man. Jeez. But I mean, he's just he looks he look, he's, he's just, timeless. He looks amazing. Charles but I'm like he's Clint Eastwood style. Like, but I'm like when he was in Desperado, he he looked old. So I was like, but like yeah. old in a good way. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so w- if you could say one thing that you've learned during your career that they don't teach in film school, what would that be? Um. There, I think the biggest thing that is really, man, that they teach in film school that is not true is that there's not any rules to this game. You know, I think they, they teach you that there's this there's this way and this way to skin the cat, you know, mm-hmm. and you get out to the real world and there is no friggin' one way to skin this cat. And, you know, once you kind of pierce the veil of Hollywood, nobody kind of knows anything really. You know, you're everybody's it's it's really the Wild West I found mm-hmm. personally. Mm-hmm. Everybody is trying to do the same thing at every level. They're trying to raise financing. They're trying to get actors to say yes. They're trying to make a good movie, and it kind of is as simple as that. And you know, I think the power struggle comes from everybody believing that it's one way to do it, and it's really not. It's kind of like you get it done the way you get it done. You know, I found that to be true uh, on my end. You know, I would agree. I would agree with you. I, and, you know and, I'm saying it's like they'll they'll make you believe that you got to get it done this way just so you can play their game. Mm-hmm. But when you play your own game and be like, hey, dude, I'm going to get it done the way I get it done, you always end up at the same spot anyways. Well, that's the thing. Like the whole story you just told me about Vigilante Diaries, like if yeah. you would have done it the way they've done it, they would do, have you do it. Yeah. That would have cost you $20 million. Totally. If not more. Well, they, uh, there's no. If I would have shopped around that script, there, it's important. Nobody would have ever made it. Right. It just would seem they're like, this is too gigantic. We can't make it for under X amount of dollars. And we just were like, I don't know, we're just going to say yes to everything and just go, you know, again, just being fearless. And and like you said, like, isn't that the indie hustle vibe? It's like, you're going to figure it out, you know, just got to get out there and also just keep creating. Yes. Keep creating. Don't sit around for five years after you make one movie and and okay, hope I something you happens sit around for a day. Cause that's all I've been doing. <laughs> you, I, I'm like, you've earned a day, sir. Watching movies, dude, <laughs> maybe a day, but no, like sit around after you make a movie for five years, waiting for the, yes. the phone no, to ring. Exactly. That's you can't do that. You not just, in this town, not <laughs> anywhere not in this town. And like, not in this landscape anymore. You know, Mm-mm. it's too much, There's, too much competition. It's just dude. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. So what advice would you give uh, a filmmaker just starting out today in today's landscape? Man, just literally the cheesy friggin' Nike advice, you know, pick up a camera and just start making a movie. Because now you can, really. Yeah. it's it's. If it was easy when I did it, it's even easier now, you know. And no. it's like, it's, man, editing, saw, everything is easier. I mean, you could you could pick up your iPhone like Tangerine and shoot. You right. know, and shoot a feature that yep. wins Sundance. Now, again, mind you, you have a good story. Story is always helpful. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, you know, it all start, it all starts there. But I mean, if you're talking about equipment, which is always a pain in the ass, you know, gear and stuff like that. Gear's cheaper than ever. Man, totally high yeah. quality, 4K, like 4K nice DSLRs, man. Get just, some, you can totally do it. It's never it's never been easier to shoot a real good looking movie, professional quality. Mm-hmm you know, than now. No, absolutely. And it's only going to get easier and easier and easier yeah, as, uh, absolutely. again, and then, and that's just to make a movie. Now, mind you, like we're talking about selling and making money and all that stuff. It's kind of, that's it. That's in a whole different bracket, but you start off with the basic, which is just getting your feet wet and, and making a movie. Just keep making content, making right. films, doing whatever you can. Eventually someone's going to take notice. Yes, absolutely. Because in all honesty though, there's, there might be a lot of people making movies, but there's not a lot of people making two and three and four and five movies. Like right. there's a lot of one timers and a lot yeah. of, I almost got out of the gate and, Oh, I just got one movie distributed to, you know, but the dude that does two or three or four or five and let alone makes a little money with it or breaks even with them. That's rare. It is. It is. Man. It's very, very rare. So, um, I got last three questions. I ask all yeah. my, all my uh, guests, um, yeah. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn in the business or out? Ooh, good one. 
Um, I, I think the lesson is, um, I think, I, I think you're me personally, what I always struggle with is the fear that nothing's going to happen again. Right. Yep. It's like you do one and then you're, you, you forget, you know, you, you get fearful that it's not going to happen again. You know, it's right. like, I've been here a lot of times now and I think, I think there's a, you know, without getting a little hokey or whatever, there is something to be said about having some faith in the process and faith in yourself and, you know, maybe faith in, you know, the, the, force, the, the power, the, the powers stuff, that be you know, the full, the movie gods, you know, like, uh, and, and I think, I, I mean, dude, I struggle with that constantly. It's like after every movie, you're like, man, what's next, you know, but I think the work will always kind of carry through. So I think the lesson that has been, it's been the hardest is to, is to have some, have some faith that the next one will come if I work for it, you know? Very good. Very good lesson. Um, now, what are your three favorite films of all time? No particular order. Aliens. Good. James Cameron, Aliens. Whew, man. It's a hard one. The new Ghostbusters, obviously. The new Ghostbusters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the new Ghostbusters. <laughs> Catwoman. Catwoman, the new <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> Batman versus Superman. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love that movie. Did you I, like it? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't I seen it yet. A lot. I I see. I like Watchmen a lot too. And that's I love Watchmen. Yeah. See Watchmen for yeah. me. Yeah. I thought it's the same thing. Got it. Um, anyways, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Okay. Um, and geez, depending on the day, I mean, something new like, you know, Gladiator. Or the, some of the classics, you know. I mean, there, I I love so many movies that the top three sure. is hard. But oh, I know, I know. I, know, I mean, yeah. Aliens, Empire. I fl- like that. I fluctuate know. between you know, Blade Runner, Fight Club, Shawshank. Yeah. Yes, see, that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, I, you could just keep going. The list yeah. keeps going and going. Yeah, I'm like the third. What would be a third? I'm thinking glad that I'm thinking like the Gladiators up there too. I'm like, I love it's like Braveheart, you know, oh, yeah, or yeah, like you, you know, see, yeah. or you know, just kind of like game changers, you know, like God dang. Yeah, I remember when I saw Blade Runner for the first time. I was like, "Damn!" Yeah, dude. It's just like, "Damn!" Yeah, I mean, dude, <laughs> talking about it had never been done before. Like everybody's copied that. Oh God! I mean, are you serious? I mean, everybody yeah. and their mothers copied that movie. Yep. Uh, and continue to copy it. Totally. Though I was working with a a director years ago, like probably like four or five years ago. Uh, he music huge music video director. Like a huge, like a big, big, big music video director, like MTV Award winner. I mean, the big thing, right? And I'm sitting there coloring something for him. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make this look a little like Blade Runner-esque. And he goes, what's that? Whoa. And I'm like, what? I, I literally stopped. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're a music video director and you haven't seen Blade Runner. Like, seriously. Everybody who's listening to this, please stop the stop it's the podcast. Netflix. Go and watch Blade Runner right now, right now. Just stop what you're doing. Watch Blade Runner. You trust? Trust me. I just saw it again, just maybe like a month ago. It's just so amazing. It's like yeah. so every 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 angle is a painting. It is every it's so good angle and how he and how he was able to um to get it done in the system is yep. fascinating. You yep. know, it's. If, anyway, I digress. Uh, but anyway, so where can people find you, man? Every uh, social media. I mean, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm at at Sescri on Instagram at S E S K R I. My Twitter and my Instagram for sure. Okay, and you have a website too, don't you? Yeah, but that's too man. I've been. I mean, as douchebaggy as it sounds, it's so not updated. Like I haven't had a chance to update with new reels and all mm-hmm. that crap. So it's like super old. It's I, like three years old. Yeah, I, w- I was going. I went there today. I was going to mention something, man. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's so old. I'm like, and I'm like, when am I going to do it? And then you have some downtime. You're like, should I start doing it? Should I and update like, this now? I don't you know, know. Then I have to cut a reel, you know, and it cuts into my like Blade Runner Netflix time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know. It's a toss up. You know, life priorities change. I right. say. Now I just send trailers. I'm like, here, check out the trailer. Oh yeah, you don't need to cut a reel, man. I don't. I don't cut reels anymore. I just like here. Just go to my website. Here's my. Re- here's- There's plenty. Yeah. Yeah, plenty of stuff sure. you can see. So, man, thank you so much for taking out the time, Dude, man. I it appreciate was a pleasure it. Pleasure to be rocking the indie film hustle with you, brother. All right, thanks, man. Man, I love having Christian on the show, man. He's he's a, a trip, and it's really inspiring to see how he's been able to do what he's done. So definitely gives us all, all, all us indie film hustlers out there 
a great inspiration to move forward. And it can be done, boys and girls. It can be done. So if you want to check out any of uh, any of the things we talked about on the show and want to check out where uh, Christian is, all his links will be in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 079. Oh, and also don't forget to head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free indie film book. Uh, There's over 16,000 books you can download from Audible, and you can get your copy for free. So freefilmbook.com. And, of course, as always, if you're interested in taking your film education up a notch, head over to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash film school. And you can check out all the courses for every topic you can imagine from screenwriting, production, uh, social media, marketing, film distribution. And we have Oscar nominated instructors uh, as well as like the screenwriter from Fight Club telling you how to do his thing. Paul Castro doing his course on uh, the Million Dollar Screenplay. We've got so many amazing courses there for you guys. So definitely check it out. IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash film school. As always, guys, thank you so, so much for listening. Thank you for all the amazing uh, well wishes on uh, This Is Meg. You guys have been sending me messages and emails like crazy, and I really appreciate all the great vibes, good uh, good energy you're sending our way, and uh, I hope that my journey can help you guys on your journey as being filmmakers because I'm going through it just like you are. I'm try- I'm hustling just like you guys are. So hopefully my journey will help you guys get to where you want to be. So thanks again for all the love, guys. I really appreciate it. And I know we've got an indie film hustle tribe here. The tribe is here to support each other to make their dreams and their films come true. So as always, keep the hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.